81 four-person teams from 26 countries began the journey of a lifetime. After four days of non-stop racing, the competitors are struggling. The fight for the Eco Challenge Championship intensifies, while others will lose their battle to merely reach the finish line. This is the most difficult race in the world. This is Eco Challenge Fiji. After more than 150 miles of racing, the lead teams have been focused on merely surviving, but time is running out. Plagued by mistakes, Ian Adamson and the American defending champions of Team Golight have fallen behind, but refuse to surrender the fight for their third straight Eco Challenge crown. Let's go again. Kicked off of Ian's championship team, Team Earthlings Isaac Wilson and Robin Benincasa are on a quest to beat Ian. But bad luck and team dissension have consistently thwarted their all-out effort. Stop talking and help. I'm all done actually racing now. Although time is drawing short for Robin and Isaac, they will not give up without a major fight to the finish. We have hope and we're never going to give up. Having lost to Ian last year, the Kiwis have returned with a vengeance. But their new team member, Christina, has fallen victim to a mysterious jungle illness. On the second day, Christina got quite sick. She was down for a couple of days. After falling more than a day behind, she has recovered. Bounce back. That was pretty good. He's having a day for me. And they have regained their legendary speed. With renewed momentum, they are rapidly chasing down Ian's team go light. For the teams at the back of the pack, winning is no longer an option. There's no award for the fastest time for like second to last and last place. They are all having problems. If she's not seen by a doctor, it's going to continue to get worse. But pride still drives them forward. In a desperate bid to regain the lead, Ian Adamson has gambled the defending champion's race on a risky strategic maneuver. Rather than conservatively following the river and enduring a three-mile swim, Ian has opted for a desperate shortcut through the dense jungle. Fighting their way through an impenetrable maze of brush and stinging thorns, the defending champions must find a primitive dirt road, a nearly impossible task. If Ian is wrong, his team may be lost in the jungle for days. If he is right, his team will have saved four hours and they'll be back with the leaders. It was just this thick wall of jungle in front of us. And it was just barely penetratable. I mean, we were just really struggling to get through it. We were moving so slow. It was miserable. Miserable, miserable place. All of a sudden, we popped out onto the road, and what a relief that was. It had been just a treacherous journey through some of the most dense bushwhacking I've ever been in in my life. Good job, guys. Awesome job. 20 minutes to get to the checkpoint. No, no, we, we had 20 minutes to spare before we dark. Can you believe that? Nelly, good job, girl. Oh, that was bloody horrible. That, that was the most heinous bushwhack I've ever done in my life. As it turned out, we got through the section in about two and a half hours, and other teams were taking seven or eight. How many teams? How many teams? Oh, yes. Three, 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 three. three. 
All right, guys. We got like four places. Rejuvenated by the success of their risky gamble, Nightfall finds Team Golight in a perfect position to take over the lead. We don't need our helmets. Rather than swimming for eight hours in energy-draining cold water, Ian Shortcut allowed his team to do this section in only four hours. Within sight of the leaders, hours of river travel will be eased by the use of portable inflatable pack rafts. As Golight launches into the cold, wet night, a beleaguered Team Earthlink arrives. Surprisingly, they are once again within reach of the lead teams, but their ambition to remain competitive has come at a heavy price. Unlike Ian, they chose the eight-hour swim in the freezing river. Now they are unable to warm up as they teeter on the brink of hypothermia. The problem with swimming, I think, after you've worked as hard as I was working, is you're so depleted. You know, you're really, you're really uh, vulnerable to hypothermia. And when I got done with that swim, I was hypothermic. By this point in the race, you have zero body fat left, and your body's already started to chew up what little energy it has stored in its muscles and everything else. And, you know, I just didn't have anything to kind of keep me warm. After being nursed back to health by his teammates, Mike Trisler has recovered. Now it's his turn to take care of Isaac. I'm feeling good now. Got rid of that parasite thing. Took some flagell last night. Well, it was funny because, you know, it's like, especially Mike, who's like this really big, tough guy, on this army best ranger, you know, kind of a macho character, and, and myself, and, uh, you know, we we're all freezing cold. No, I'm having to take everything off and put this on. He'll be warm in two seconds. <laughs> My freaking dog car. There we are, trying to keep each other warm in the middle of the wilderness. And you just get that back on. Once you get warm, you uh, that took a lot, lot out of Isaac that night, and just getting hypothermia is a really bad way to go. You lose a lot of energy, shivering and being cold. That was a bad night. He got to the point where he literally couldn't talk to us anymore. We're like, Ike, are you okay? Ike, you okay? And all we could hear is, you know, just the shivering sounds. And, and we knew that he was coming to the end of his rope in terms of what he could handle, you know, hypothermia-wise. Having caught up with Team Earthlink, Christina has also fought back against illness, and the Kiwis have resumed their quest for vengeance and the lead. I stopped vomiting, so that was quite a break for as well. My temperature came down, and I, and I stopped vomiting. And ultimately, that was the beginning of my recovery. When Christina came right, we were in really good shape. We had no trouble with our feet. We'd been eating a huge amount of food. We'd been hydrated. We'd had lots of sleep. And we knew that the teams out front had been racing each other and trashing themselves. We're not going to have as much left at the end of the race than what we had. It was quite reassuring. One hundred miles back from the fight for first place, Morning finds the teams at the back of the pack struggling to finish the first mountain bike leg before a mandatory race cutoff, a measure put in place to keep teams from falling too far behind. Continually mired in last place, Team Go is determined to remain in the race no matter what the cost. But foot problems have been plaguing this team since before the race even began. Seven weeks before the Fiji race, Sully sustained a serious foot injury requiring 70 stitches. Miraculously, his feet are holding up, but his team is not even halfway through the race, and some of the hardest trekking is yet to come. Coming into checkpoint four, uh, we were really, really pushing it. We had been going so hard all morning that it was a, a gigantic sense of relief. We had to make this cutoff, so. And I think me and Sarah were really feeling it. But uh, the guys really pulled together and literally <laughs> pushing on bikes up hills. Dara, the hell is that, Sarah? That's disgusting. Let's get some of the, let's get our first aid kits out and fix her up. There's, there's no medic here. This is raw, right? Um, yeah. that, look, that looks as bad as it is. You just let it dry. When her feet were pretty much bleeding, I was looking at it into her eyes and I could just see the pain in her eyes and you just wanted to hold her, you know, like a little sister because I just felt bad for her. Six weeks of foot problems, and this makes my foot problem look like a scratch. What I want to do is just put this on some vet rattle. This will stay on in the water. This is what I used on my foot the whole time. I took more 
medical supplies in anyone. And when I saw Sarah's feet, I basically used the last of the supplies that were meant for my foot to wrap her feet up. Put these patches over where it hurts the most. It was really ironic that Sully's feet were perfectly fine. And I was sitting there looking at my feet going, ugh. That makes you feel uh, inadequate and slow and lame. <laughs> this is what held my foot together on those first three days and uh, put it on nice and tight and you can see it. Is that too tight, sir? Huh? When do we next see a medic? Because I'm giving up everything I've got. This is a serious situation here. She wanted to go on and I'm looking at her feet. Um, this girl can't continue and she just put her socks on and she had a five minutes sleep in the mud and she carried on walking without saying a single word. And I know that she was absolutely in excruciating pain through that part of the race. And she kept going, and, but she's just strong. I don't know what it would take to break Sarah down. I knew that she was gonna have a struggle ahead of her to, to stay in the race. She's a really strong athlete and a really strong person and I thought that she would be able to handle the task. Once this fungus gets into your feet, every step is agony. I think it's almost certainly a race-ending situation for anybody, no matter how strong. If it had been a heavyweight boxing match, the ref would have just, you know, stopped the fight. But um, Sarah wanted to keep fighting, so I just think that's, that's a huge accomplishment on her part. Teams continue to fight their way across the daunting course, but for some, the race has become too much. Watch that, gonna be really weak now. Battered by personal conflicts and team dissension, the military veterans of Team Lupus have run one of their teammates into the ground. He's so weak now, he can barely move. So we're gonna get an IV in him. Maurice has fallen victim to severe dehydration and must decide if he can continue the race. He's coming, he's been vomiting for a few days. So we've given him something for that, and that seems to have settled him down. All his observations are fine, and we'll see how he goes over the next few minutes, and we'll make a decision as to how he goes from there. It was difficult, and it, it was it was extremely frustrating. At the same time, you know, it was Maurice's slot. He was the captain, and I felt like we really had to get Maurice to either say, I'm not going to go forward. We had to hear a doctor say it, and it became apparent Maurice was not going to say that. Those words weren't going to come out of his mouth, so we were going to have to wait for them to come out of the doctor's mouth. At this stage, it's not in Maurice's best interest for him to continue. We've suggested that his race finishes now. But you understand what Maurice done. It's not in your best interest for you to continue. You totally understand that. We're disqualified, and that, I mean, the last races I've done, the same situation has happened. One person, unfortunately, has been dropped out of the race, and so, yeah, I'm upset. I mean, it's a lot of time of training, all that effort, all that money, all that time being away from my family, burning up all my annual leave that I have for the whole year that I could have spent with my family. It's just gone on that point of Maurice getting sick. Maurice ended up like he did and collapsed when he did because he was pushed way too hard. Everyone wants to go do the eco, but not everyone is prepared to do the eco, and he's not prepared. He wasn't prepared to do the eco. You're only as strong as your weakest link, and you don't pick on people that are, are weak. Um, they're, they're a part of your team, and if you have to carry gear, if you have to carry them, you do it. I can't do the work for every single person. I try to. Eco Challenge is all about team dynamics. It's not going to work just to be physically strong and fit or technically very proficient at maybe mountain biking or climbing. If the team doesn't have unity and compassion for each other, it will defeat a team. It's the only way for a team to make it is to work cohesively together. But if I wanted to force them to quit, I would have done it the first day of the race. I would have took off at a dead run and none of them would have kept up. The number one rule of adventure racing is you're only as fast as your slowest person. And if you don't abide by that rule, you will destroy your team. It, it will happen. And, and it did. One hundred miles and days ahead of the back of the pack, the defending champions of Team Golight have moved into a tie for the lead. This next section of the course races through the infamous hunting grounds of Fiji. 
Once home to cannibals, this open grassland provides no relief as last night's hypothermia gives way to searing tropical heat. From checkpoint seven, the, the nature of the terrain and the environment changed dramatically. We'd gone through the, some of the densest jungle we'd ever seen to all of a sudden grasslands, kind of open savanna. It was almost like the Serengeti on hills. Buff decided that they'd head down back that direction anyway and back off to the west. And we thought that it would just add distance and, and take a lot more time and effort. The Spaniards took off on another route they thought was going to be a better choice. And as it turned out, we ended up descending a thousand vertical feet into this valley where the road dead ended and we had to backtrack out and it was frustrating, extremely frustrating. We ended up on a, on a wrong ridge line, which diverged from the ridge line we wanted to be on originally. Then we'd start getting divided opinions. Mm, that's, you think this is that one? Yeah. So where was this? Well, I'm not so sure. My feeling with navigation is that if you've got eight eyes looking at the course and looking at the map making decisions, then you're going to be that much better. You know, you're going to be four times better than two eyes. I believe... Well, then, then if we want to go to Natoka, we need to go this no, way. No, we don't need we to. We don't want to go to Natoka. That was the time we wanted to go. That was... Originally, we wanted to do that. So we're still going to stick with this? No. no. Here. Well, last time we did this. No, last time we did this. No, I want to do this. No, I want to do... It's not the most direct, because the most direct would have been... Well, the one thing that we... The one with the waypoint. I like to know where I am and where I'm going. And so we've got these four strong-willed people exerting their strong will on what to do. I think we're doing exactly the right thing. <laughs> How about that, but... Oh, I do. I really think I'm we're doing... A this is not a detour. I actually had to exert my strong hand of navigational authority quite frequently because there were so many infinite options about how, how to go and where to go. As the clock continues to tick, teams at the back of the pack battle their way through the Grand Canyon of Fiji, a trip made difficult by the rushing white water. The reality show veterans of Team Mad River are eco-challenge rookies. Although they have been barely avoiding disqualification due to time cutoffs, their fun-loving attitude turns the river kayak into a chance to enjoy this modern-day expedition. Now I'm floating down the river in my nice little inflatable kayak, go through, pro I don't think it was like a class three rapid, the first big one, and I get dumped. He loses the paddle. The paddle gets lodged in the rocks next to mine. Ethan goes screaming by down the rapids, and here I am stuck with two rafts, two paddles, and I have no idea what to do. And then I look over and I see Tim, and he's just perched, like, in his boat, above water level, on a rock, and he's like, and I'm like, how the hell did I end up here? Only could this happen to us. We're the eco chef. I mean, my boat is sucked into the raft. Tim can't even get it out right now. I mean, like, who would that happen to us but us? Of course it happens to us. All my crap is there too. Okay? And my mother boat is still safe! It's wedged on a rock! I'd kind of through too much stress leading up to this point, and my rap got stuck, and I had enough. I just sat there and assessed the situation. It was like, I'm fine with a long afternoon's nap. Yeah, I could, I could see Ethan downstream waiting for me to uh, unravel this riddle. So now we're half an hour behind schedule and I feel like, all right, shoot, this is kind of my fault because I got dumped. So we got to make up some time. As darkness falls, the Spanish of Team Buff surprise everyone as they emerge from the hunting grounds in first place. Sharing the lead with Ian Adamson and the defending champions, the Spanish boldly chose a different route through this section of the course. Their route choice pays off as they now find themselves five hours ahead of Ian. Although regarded as one of the best expedition racing teams in the world, 
These elite racers have never won an Eco Challenge. They led almost the entire way during Eco Challenge Morocco, but only hours from the finish line, battered feet and fatigue forced them to drop out of the race. This year, they are back to settle unfinished business. Our team, Team Buff, came five hours ahead in the CP8 because we chose a trail that it was very, very good. And it was, I don't know, lucky. We have to take as much as we can in time. The advantage now in the mountain bike and in the trekking section after, because if not, they will eat us. <laughs> <laughs> You never know till the end. You just to keep on going and you don't know, have it. You don't know, have the first place, the second, the third, till you cross the finish line. Americans of Team Golight emerge at the second mountain bike pickup only to find they are now five hours behind the Spanish. Ian's bad route choice in the hunting grounds has cost them the lead. Buff was just here a little bit ago. They were? Yeah. They left at 1.13. We thought we had done a, a decent job all in all. It turns out we were five hours behind Team Buff. Yeah, yeah. Buff was here at 9 p.m. Yeah. Oh, I find that hard to believe. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's the truth. They nailed it. It was incredible how fast those guys were moving. We definitely need some sleep now, so we're going to grab a couple of hours. That will allow us to push through, potentially, to the finish if we want to. As a new day dawns, the Americans rush to get on their bikes in an attempt to regain the lead. They are hours behind the Spanish, and the dark horse South Africans are right on their heels. If we can get together a good bike leg today, I think we can hold on to you know, fourth or fifth and then just take from there. And there are, like you said, there's a lot of unhappy looking people walking around here. So who knows, maybe we can pick up an extra position or two, give it our best shot to the finish. It's been a long race. <laughs> As the Americans quickly set out in pursuit of the Spanish, a revitalized team Earthlink enters the mountain bike transition with renewed confidence. We get to the next transition and everybody is there. And once again, there we are in the mix of all the lead teams. We were feeling ourselves getting back in the game, and we had literally caught them. So if we had a good, solid, fast transition, we'd be right back in there. Can you get started on boxing these things up? And I'll yeah. hand unloading them when I get the box over there. <laughs> oh my gosh, and these backpacks are unbelievably heavy. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of for a tropical race, to have an 80-pound backpack. I went to, the, to leave, and... And I look back and nobody had done anything. Like they're just standing looking at open boxes of gear spread all over the place. Come on guys, Robin, what's going on? I really, really, really wanted us to motivate. And, uh, and when nobody seemed to want to motivate, I just, you know, I just kind of lost it. Oh my gosh, you can't believe it. You know, it was such a rookie move to be that angry about stuff. I should just let it go. Got some feet. Here's this guy. We can put a couple of things on him if you like. It's going to take a bit of time. Happy with that? How long will it take? Oh, 15 minutes. minutes. OK, that's fine. And I thought, my goodness, like we just worked so hard, so hard to make up this time. And, uh, and now we're just going to give it back away again. You know, we're just going to hand it back to him. The Kiwis arrive only minutes behind. Although losing an entire day due to Christina's illness, the Kiwis have regained their strength and speed and are eager to make a push for the lead. Yeah, well, I mean, we're figuring that there's got to be a fairly big kayak out there and um, paddling's good for us. So yeah, I guess it'll just come down to see what the people got left and uh, yeah, go from there. With their surging momentum, the Kiwis are on a pace to overtake the Americans in this next section of the course. While the Kiwis rally, Team Earthlink is left behind at the transition, unable to work together as a team. Even though they have been able to fight their way back to the leaders, they once again find themselves falling victim to a lack of teamwork. Yeah, I built all four bikes and then got my own shit together, loaded it on the trailer, and I look over there, it's still the yard sale. What's going on? The bikes can be built and we could be going nowhere without the maps. So it's irrelevant. I mean, you did a great job, but it shouldn't be frustrating you. We couldn't go anywhere. Ready and sitting here, waiting for Jason to be It was. 
he, all he had to do was close his box and we walked over here. That's all that happened when he got done with the maps. Unfortunately, Seagate beat us out of the transition area. They did leave? Yeah. You guys need to just chill. All you guys, just chill. All right. We got, we got a lot of race here. You just chill, dude. You're wasting a lot of energy right now. At that point, Seagate had, had already come in and done a really fast transition, and they were already on their way out. And they had just kicked our butts in this transition. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration came from. And Isaac just completely lost it there, I thought. And he was totally out of line. I was very upset in that transition. I don't I didn't remember doing anything other than just being so angry. They like each other I was done. Much. I was Dude, why didn't you, tell you guys us were then? messing around. Why didn't you tell us? I mean, we were just we were in one of those clusters where we were looking at you, you were looking at us, and and we were both waiting for each other. Ah! Oh. How did you quit? I'm all done actually racing now. <laughs> you know, everyone's doing the best they can. It just seems sometimes that um, it's never good enough uh, you know, for ourselves because we expect so much more to, you know, to be faster. Right there. We had a bad transition, you know? We didn't do the things we were supposed to do. We didn't do our assigned jobs. We were, we were a bunch of soup sandwiches in there. That's the way it is. And sure enough, we just blew so much time in that transition. And once our momentum is lost, then it's a bad thing for us because we just worked so hard to make up this time. And now we're just gonna give it back away again. This second leg of mountain biking proves to be as brutal as the first. The hilly terrain and now searing heat make progress difficult even for experienced bikers on their best day. But these competitors have traveled 200 miles for five days straight through brutal terrain with only 10 hours of sleep. The Spanish maintain their hard-fought lead and finish the biking leg in first place. When we stopped in the mountain bike section, uh, we were scared. We were scared because David had, at that point, a uh, uh, pain in his feet. Uh, it was painful. Yo, una tendinitis en, en el tibial y en el tendón de Aquiles, no en cada pie. Cuando camino me duele mucho, pero... We just put all our energy there and said, come on, let's do a good trekking. As the Spanish head over the mountains toward the coast, David's injured feet will certainly slow them down, but every team is suffering. An ascent over the coastal range leads to one of the most spectacular sections of the course. A rope descent down the middle of a raging 400-foot waterfall. The height alone makes this rappel frightening, and relentless pounding from the water increases the fear. A steep canyon descent will lead to 20 miles of road to the coast. But the last 12 hours on battered feet are forcing the Spanish to slow down. As the Spanish make their way to the coast, the brutal nature of the Eco Challenge race course claims yet another victim. HQ, HQ, this is CP5, Team 13, Team Kodak has chosen to be withdrawn from the course and requests transport off the course. Having come right from a movie set, Eco Challenge rookie Hayden Christensen has spent days struggling through the jungle and has fought unimaginable fatigue. But Eco Challenge has proven to be too much. For Hayden and his family, there is no shame as their race ends halfway through the course. Showing a courageous effort, the movie star and his siblings have endured more of the course than many other more experienced teams. I just heard that Team Kodak pulled out of Eco Challenge, and I can totally understand their reasoning. They had about 23 hours with which to make the next cutoff, and the average times were 25 to 30 hours, and this was a fairly slow team. It would have been soul destroying for them to have hiked up the next valley, knowing every step that we're getting further and further away from a goal that they were walking towards. We all wanted to go on, but we were like, guys, do you guys want to get pulled out of this thing halfway through it? Because it doesn't look like we're able to make it to the next checkpoint. And we had just raced to make it through the previous two checkpoints and had just made it by the skin of our teeth. And the thought of 28 straight hour trek we would have to have done in 23 hours or to make it through, we were just like, it's not gonna happen. 
And then we were just left standing there realizing that it would be impossible for us to make the next checkpoint by the cutoff time. I feel really bad for my brother and sister and, and it was really, really disappointing. We came to finish this race. I think there's never any shame in not finishing Eco Challenge. Just arriving at the start line is a huge success. Finishing at the finish line with all four members, the cream. And if you get a third of the way, half of the way, what a great experience. It truly is one of the world's great adventures. I, I came to do it with my brother and sister, but I also came to test myself. So uh, first and foremost, you sort of figure out your own you know, limits. And, but for the most part, it's just like an unworldly appreciation for just the simplest things in life. Honestly, I thought there was a chance that maybe this idea of mine was actually a bad thing to be getting my family into. But I'm very glad we did that. And I think it was a good thing for myself and for them and for us together. And I think we're, we're coming out of it as better people. Although they are world-class mountain bikers, the defending champions of Team Golight are disappointed to lose yet another hour on this section of the course. We got into the transition area six hours down on buff, so we were losing time to them. That thing that's up front, called the Spanish Team Buff, was set an awesome pace. But they tend to like to do that sometimes, and maybe they'll crack. It's a prime time to make an error. There's still probably a day and a half to go, maybe more and you know you can gain and lose a large amount of time in a very short period in these races and we've seen it already happen a lot. Two days ago, the Kiwis race looked to be all but over due to Christina's serious illness. But the Kiwis are notorious for their never say die attitude and all or nothing spirit and have rallied back. By the end of the mountain bike leg, a fully recharged Kiwi team has passed three teams and is now right on the heels of the Americans. Feeling good now. Just in time. All of us were feeling fantastic, which was, you know, that you dream about in adventure racing. Getting to a point where the whole team can move fast. You know, all of us were, were just totally on fire, ready to go. If Christina fully recovered and his team at full strength, Nathan and the Kiwis ready themselves for a charge at the leaders. After a brutal climb through the mountains and a stunning 400-foot rappel, the Spanish have maintained their dominating lead. But the non-stop pace has taken a toll on their weary bodies, and David's inflamed tendonitis has forced the team to slow down. David had, at that point, a, a pain in his feet. The Spanish emerged from the mountains prepared to endure a painful 20-mile walk to the coast. But race organizers have something else in mind. With busy roads to contend with down to the water, the race organizers have set up a car shuttle to maintain the safety of the racers as they head to the coast. The car ride momentarily buoys the Spaniard spirits. Still hobbled by searing pain, David will use this welcome opportunity to rest his battered feet. The brief car ride ends with the Spanish finishing their brutal land portion of the race at the coast. They are in the lead, but must now get in kayaks and expose their blistered feet to salt water as they paddle 70 miles on the open ocean. Their destination is Waia Island. Right now they're way in front of the ocean leg ahead and think the Eco Challenge is still anybody's game. As the Spanish prepare for the ocean paddle, race organizers hand out the maps for the final section of the course. Knowing that David is struggling, Emma is horrified to learn that the finish line is still more than a day away. This is another day race. <laughs> we thought you were done? No champagne yet. So no, we... we don't know. With one day more race, it's yeah. hard. Forty miles behind the leaders, the Brazilians face the same plight as those teams far behind them. They struggle merely to put one foot in front of the other. 
After enduring 15 hours in freezing rain and storm-swollen rivers, they have taken refuge in an abandoned drainage pipe. Exhausted, their only hope of staving off the debilitating effects of hypothermia is to keep moving. But the cold has brought them to the edge, and Nora, the team navigator, seems to be the worst of them all. She's so bad. I just wanted to feel warm, you know, and I couldn't. So I was trying to feel warm and think warm, but I couldn't. I was so cold. Unaware that she is suffering from something even more serious than first stage hypothermia, Nora is desperate to keep warm. I'm wet already, so. I don't know, I won't be dry. We just have to make a move because if she stays still like that, she's going to be freezing all the time. So she has to move. Stand up, walk around and let's go because once you start to move, you warm up your body. So. Six days ago, mere hours into the race, Nora cut her finger. In her rush to keep moving and push for the lead, she failed to seek medical attention. In this tropical environment, infection is certain in any wound left untreated. As Nora suffers in the cold, a serious infection is working its way to the surface. But the Brazilians are unaware. Couldn't be worse. And raining. To keep them out of the water, the Brazilians will use small inflatable pack rafts for this next section of the course. Still exhausted, wet, and in first stage hypothermia, the Brazilians head back out into the cold Fijian night. They are pushing themselves past their physical limits in an attempt to complete their goal and finish at the front of the pack. I was keeping my pain to myself because I was trying to be as strong as I could. And I was trying to keep my mind like up and to concentrate, but it's hard. The Americans have had little sleep as they prepare for the long ocean kayak. To their surprise, the Kiwis arrive only minutes behind. In an ironic twist, Nathan and Ian are poised for a repeat of last year's dramatic battle to the finish. Only a year ago in New Zealand, Nathan's attempt to dominate the race by not sleeping backfired as he collapsed mere hours from the finish line. The last minute breakdown ended a home turf Kiwi dynasty as Ian's team claimed the Eco Challenge crown. Vowing revenge, Nathan has led the Kiwis back into a showdown with Ian and the Americans. The last transition onto the ocean, pretty much looking at each other in the transition going, here we go again, let's race. So we were never at all thinking, okay, the Spanish are gone, let's just race for second here. It was like we were totally going for the win the whole time. I think we left about, as it turned out, maybe five, ten minutes behind the Kiwis. As the race for the lead heats up, morning finds a delirious Nora wandering alone on a primitive road. After a long night in the freezing rain and frigid waters, Nora's body is racked with illness, giving in to the infection coursing through it. I've never seen her like this. I've been racing her like for five years and I've never seen her like this. Did it feel good last night? I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> but she started to feel bad. She look her hand. She was she has this infection. And then she was falling a lot. And once she fell down, she it couldn't get up anymore. We're taking her to the PC so she can rest, get warm, and get better. You guys aren't thinking of pulling out of the race, are you? No. Of course not! Nah, no, no, Quit the race. <laughs> never. The never girls finish. never quit. Nora was really bad. We had to carry her. I was carrying her backpack. Shubi was carrying her. And she was hallucinating and cold. The 
We got to CP7, we put her sitting by the fire, took her clothes off. What is it? It's very small. And yes. And she has on this other hand, here, look at the wood. Here. Well, she started to feel bad last night. Um, like, kind of dizzy, she was falling a lot. And then she fell. Have you had a pulse on her lately? But this infection in her arm right here is, is pretty bad. And it happened so fast because, yeah. you know, like yesterday during the day it was okay. Is and the pain in this arm up here? It's sore up here too? It is? Let's see. Can you lift your arm for me? She's got some type of puncture wound or something that she got in her left hand and it's uh, got infected. It looks like it's uh, within 24 hours or so and the infection looks like it's spreading up her arm and she's definitely got some type of chills going on. I don't know if it's a fever or if she's getting hypothermic, but she's definitely not doing well. See, this is all swollen in here too. Look at this. Is it sore, Nora? Is this hurt? Can you feel that? Can you feel your toes down here? She's complaining a lot about this feel leg. This? Does it hurt up your leg at all? It happens here in Fiji. Within 24 hours, anything that you get cut that isn't treated will get infected. And there's been a bunch of the guys have had problems. Did you call for help? No, we didn't. You guys have to make a call. If it was my decision, I'd send her out. While Nora's condition continues to deteriorate, race management can only recommend that Nora see a doctor. But the decision to do so rests in the hands of her and her teammates. What started as a simple cut on the first day of racing has now become a serious problem for Nora. As the infection ravages her body, Nora fights to stay in the race. Sixty miles ahead, the leaders begin their final charge for the finish line. The Spanish are pulling away from the pack, but their five-hour lead may not be enough. When we arrived in the CP13, he couldn't do a step. Having caught the Americans, the Kiwis are back with a vengeance. Come on! but they aren't willing to settle for second place. Once we got into the front, there was no way we were going to look back. And for those rookies still in the race, exhaustion and bad weather are only getting worse and time is running out. The race will come to a dramatic conclusion and more teams will drop out. <laughs> 